Okay, the macro <clears throat> perspective that is being presented works in a wonderful way. If you look at the example uh, given in the last portion of this message last week, you will see or rather start to see the big picture certain connections uh, begin to form from Abraham a single man who we call the father of faith beget Isaac had a covenant with the Lord and that covenant with the Lord starts to reveal itself in a small form in Abraham's life. He has a son with his wife uh, through faith and a miracle due to their age. Uh, he defeats the kings but let's fast forward to what Abraham did in his operation of faith to Jacob and then fast forward to the tribes the children of Israel in Egypt now we have removed hundreds of years from Abraham and we look at the children of Egypt leaving their enslavement in by the millions being led by Moses and God's word to Abraham that your descendants will be the sand of the sea and he also mentioned their captivity for 400 years and they would be led out all of this prophecy and the word of the Lord the conversation the relationship that Abraham had with God came to pass but we only live today around 70 80 maybe 100 years by reason of strength and faith uh, in the Lord, 120. We can declare that over our lives and it's the Lord may okay that if it is in his will. But Abraham did not see his descendants becoming the sand of the sea he did not see his descendants coming out of Egypt but he still believed the word of the Lord and he operated within his microcosm in faith in strong faith to the Lord he, he made connections based on the prophecy when uh, God commanded him to go to a mount and, and, and sacrifice his son he did that without any relative hesitation and was fully committed to do that but in the Bible, in Hebrews 11, it said he reckoned within his mind that the Lord would make his promise come true that through Isaac, his seed, multitudes would come forth. And in our physical eyes, the commandment of the Lord 
in that specific incident to sacrifice his son would mean the end of the prophecy, end of the promise, his family lineage, they would be the, no more. And that's what we see in the physical. We see we see a, a death, we see an end to our family based on that very specific incident. But he reckoned in his love and in his faith that was in his heart and considered the promise in his mind, just as we need to do today, we need to be in the word of God. We need to be considering the prophecies, considering the promises of God and plan our life accordingly and make our decisions accordingly. Revelations is a very good part to study and see what the end. Just as God told Abraham, he told Isaac, he told Jacob, he told Joseph, prophecies. Joseph knew that the children of Israel were gonna come out at a time, so he told him them to, to make sure you take my bones when you leave. And this was 400 or, or 350 years, 300 and some odd years after uh, Joseph passed away. So he made plans, he, he gave the word to the people who were living at that time to, to make plans so when y'all leave, take my bones with you. According to the word of the Lord, this is gonna come to pass. And let's take another look at that period between, uh, let's say Abraham and Egypt, the hundreds of years, or, or better yet, the, the period between when Joseph passed away and the 300 some odd years that the children of Israel uh, were living in prosperity and in prominence because Joseph was the savior of Egypt. But then after a period of time, when a king arose who did not know Joseph, nor regard what he did for Egypt and began to enslave the children of Israel, put them in bondage and then kill off the male children actively now how are we going to react when we're in that period that period of trial that period of testing the periods of of persecution do we continue to look at the prophecy and in one day we're coming out that's what the word of the lord or do we focus on the issues at hand, the persecution, the struggle. And I am quite sure that that many of the Israelites or a significant portion lived their entire lives in the shadow of Egypt. In other words, they were born in Egypt, either during Joseph's uh, prominence or they were born in Egypt during Moses' time when they were under bondage and lived a significant portion of their lives or all of their lives under either bondage or prominence but they were in Egypt and they were living in that culture And the question would be, did they hold on to the prophecy of the Lord and the word of the Lord that was given to their family, given to their forefathers? And we can say the same thing today. Are we holding on to the word of the Lord, to the prophecy, to the covenant that Christ has made with all of us who choose to enter into that covenant with him? 
And as the world turns and the situations in the world, the turmoil, the peace, they oscillate in our lives like a like a frequency up and down, up and down. Good times, bad times, good times, bad times, and and the highs and lows of life. But if you look at from Abraham or even from Adam to the present time, to David's time, if you look at that, the word of the Lord is like a straight line going through all of that. It, regardless of the ups and downs of the life of men, God's word is consistent through all of that. And we must begin to not focus on the ups and downs of life, but on God's word, which is consistent and true through everything in every situation. God's word is going to come to pass. And even if we if we stand on God's word for our our time in this earth, if the promises do not come to pass and we remain faithful to the best of our ability and and our situation, our present distress and our present situations, we remain faithful, then then the promise for our lives are, are, are going to be just as direct and straight as the word of God so we don't line up with the highs and lows of the of our human lives in this earth we line our lives up with the word of God so that we can be consistent coming across for our time in this earth the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we, we go consistent through this. And that's what the macro, one of the uh, benefits of looking at these Old Testament situations from a macro pr perspective, you see that God's word runs consistent. And all of the daily minutia of, of men's lives, although they are important, and they seem important at the at the period of time that they occur. We we still must go and look at the word of God. And just as when the Israelites were in slavery, uh, when when the new Pharaoh uh, was was persecuting them, they could still have joy, knowing that one day, if I don't make it out, my children will see the deliverance of the Lord in full fashion. Just as Abraham didn't see the promise, all of the promise being fulfilled, he still had benefits. He didn't see the full uh, promise and none of us will see the full promise until uh, the coming of the Lord. But if we focus on the promise, on the word of the Lord, then we will become participants in bringing the promise to fruition in our present time. We become workers with the Lord in bringing about his will in the earth for the specific appointed time. Now let's take a look at Hebrews 11 starting at verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, 
offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19 is very important. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. What the macro view of Old Testament prophecy and, and accounts allows us today to reason within ourselves. We have the love of God in our heart and then now our minds can reason what the prophecy means for us today. As it was said in Hebrews 11, and I'll reiterate, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Because he reasoned that God could make the prophecy come to pass because the promise was in verse 18 even though God had said to him it is through Isaac that your offspring will be begotten and we can call this reasoning by faith in God just as during the springtime uh, a diligent person will consider that winter will be coming it is several months down the road, but they begin to plan for the coming winter. Well, in the case of the prophecies of God, they are hundreds and thousands of years in the future, but we still, as children of God, must act in faith and alignment to the promise and the prophecies and word of God. And we can go back to Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And there we see it again. What we as children of God must do, we must regard, we must reckon, and then we must be looking ahead to his reward or the promise or prophecy of God. And then in verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So we have those three things. Regard, looking ahead, and persevering. And our motivation for persevering is the promise, the prophecy of God that is to come and are mentally regarding it, reckoning the promise of God. And this is the action of faith. Now in part one, we went through a lot of snapshots of the Old Testament uh, accounts. I don't wanna say stories. They were accounts, they were true. And that was an exercise to get your mind the mental pictures of Abraham. We can go to Adam, we can go to Noah, we can go to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel in Egypt. All of those snapshots, and we look at the promise. God told Abraham, your, your children will be like the sand of the sea. God also told Abraham that they would be in prison for a period of years. And that your children would inherit the land that he was traveling in. Did he see that? No. And what we come to is 
a different type of faith. It's a different faith to live your life according to prophecy and the word of God than to live your life according to the example I gave earlier of the springtime and planning for the winter. And the faith that we need is the gift of God that we get when we first believe to handle the prophecy of planning our lives through a period of a hundred or a thousand years on something that's to come. But we have to consider that daily. That's why we must meditate in the word of the Lord daily, constantly considering the promise. While the children of Israel were being enslaved in Egypt, they could persevere that ill treatment with joy that one day they would be delivered. And if not them, they could prepare their children to be delivered. The sad and unfortunate thing is the people that do not regard the promise and prophecy and word of the Lord and the people that live their life day day by day, month by month, season by season with no godly discernment, no fear or, or regard of their creator and they make decisions for themselves and their family and their lineage based on worldly pursuits and if a testing a situation of testing comes They will be utter failures and count it with the wicked because they have no armament against the wicked forces present in this world. They have no promise of God. They have no godly faith. And therefore they will be easy prey for the wicked one. And we can see that in the actions of Saul compared with David. This is going to be a different comparison. This is going to be a little more succinct. We're going to look at the behaviors and the positives and the negatives of what happened between two anointed individuals, two members of the Hebrew people, and two Hebrew kings, Saul and David. One of the biggest differences that we see between Saul and David is in their value systems. They both want to take care of the kingdom of Israel, but they seek to implement their strategies from a different mindset and a different value system. Samuel anointed both of these men from the word of God, yet one of them went to utter failure and destruction and the other one took the path of righteousness, forgiveness, mercy, 
and grace of the Lord. But brothers and sisters, that is all the time we have for today. We will get into a comparison of David and Saul in part three. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. Amen.